Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Hewlett Packard Enterprise Voice of the Customer podcast series. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at InterArbor Solutions, your host and moderator for this ongoing discussion on business digital transformation. Stay with us now to learn how agile companies are fending off disruption in favor of innovation. Our next case study explores how data analysis services startup Blue Labs in Washington, D.C. helps presidential campaigns better know and engage with potential voters. We'll learn how Blue Labs relies on analytics platforms that allow a democratization of querying, of opening the value of vast big data resources to more of those in the need to know. In this example of helping organizations work smarter by leveraging innovative statistical methods and technology, we'll discover how specific types of voters can be identified and reached. Here to describe how big data is being used creatively by contemporary political organizations for two-way voter engagement. We're joined by Eric Discant. He's the co-founder and vice president of Impact at Blue Labs Analytics in Washington. Welcome, Eric. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We're very delighted to have you. Um, obviously, this is a busy season for the uh, analytics people that are focused on politics and campaigns. What are some of the trends that are different in 2016 from just, say, two years, four years ago? There's a fast-changing uh, technology set. It's also a fast-changing methodology. And, of course, the trends about how voters think and react and use social and engage are also dynamic. So what's different this cycle? So from a um, voter engagement perspective, um, moving back to 2012, we could reach most of our voters online through a relatively small set of social media channels, through Facebook, through Twitter, um, a little bit on the Instagram side. Moving into 2016, we see a fragmentation of the online and offline media consumption landscape and much more folks moving towards um, much more folks moving towards purpose-built social media platforms. So if I'm at the HP conference and I want my colleagues back in, back in DC to see what I'm seeing, then maybe I'll use Periscope, maybe Facebook Live, but maybe Periscope. If I see something that I think you know, one of my friends will think is really funny, I'll send that to them on Snapchat. Um, what that means is that where political campaigns have traditionally broadcasted messages out through the sort of news feed style social media strategies. Now we need to consider how it is that one-to-one -one social media is acting as a force multiplier for, for our events and for the ideas of our candidates filtered through our campaign's champions. Mm. So perhaps a way to look at that is you're no longer focused on precincts physically and you're no longer able to use broadcast through social media, it's much more of a influence within communities and identifying those communities in a new way through these apps, perhaps more than platforms. That's exactly right. Um, and it actually, it looks a lot like the way that Democratic campaigns have always organized voters at the door and on the phone. Um, just now we think of one more way that if you want to be a champion for a candidate, you can be a champion by knocking on doors for us by making phone calls, by making phone calls through online platforms. You can also use one-to-one -one social media channels to let your friends know why the, um, why the election matters so much to you and why they should turn out and vote or, um, or vote for the issues that really matter to you. Hmm. Um, so it's interesting. We're, we're talking about retail campaigning, mm -hmm. but it's a bit more virtual. Uh, what's interesting, though, is you can get a lot more data through the interaction than you might if you were physically knocking on someone's door. So I think that the, the, the data is the data's different. Um, and what we're starting to see um, is a shift from demographic targeting. So going back to, you know, to, to, to the year 2000, we were targeting on, on precincts. Going a little bit later than that, we were targeting on um, on combinations of demographics, on soccer moms, on um, on you know on single women, on on single men, um, on you know on rural, urban, suburban communities separately. Um, moving to 2012, we looked at everything that we knew about a person, 
and built individual level predictive models so that we knew each person's individual set of characteristics were made that person more or less likely to be someone that our candidate that would have an engaging conversation with with a volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we're starting to see is behavioral characteristics trumping de trumping demographic or um, or even sort of consumer data. So you can target based on you know you can put whiskey drinkers in your model, you can put you know you can put cat owners in your model. But isn't it a lot more interesting to put in your model, this person has an online profile on our website and this is their click stream? Isn't it much more interesting to put in a model, um, this person is likely to consume media via TV, this person's likely to be a cord cutter, this person's likely to be a social media trendsetter, this person's likely to... Um, to, to view multiple channels, to use both Facebook and also to consume media on TV. Mm. Um, what that lets us do is it lets us have a really broad, reach a really broad set of interested voters rather than just creating an echo chamber where we're talking to the same voters across different platforms. Mm. So over time, the analytics tools have gone from semi-blunt instruments to much more precise and you're also able to then, therefore, better target what you think would be the right voter for you to get the right message out to. Great. So one of the things you mentioned, though, that struck me is the word predictive. Um, I suppose I think of campaigning as uh, looking to influence people and that polling then tries to predict what will happen as a result. Is there somewhat of a uh, less daylight between these two than I'm uh, thinking, that being predictive and campaigning uh, are much more closely associated, and, and how would that work? So when I think of predictive modeling, what I think of is predicting something that the campaign doesn't know. So that, so that may be something that will happen in the future. It may be something that already exists today, but just hasn't, but that we don't have an observation for. Um, in the case of the role of polling, what I really see that about is understanding what issues matter the most to voters um, and how it is that we can craft uh, messages that resonate with those issues. Um, when I think of predictive analytics, I think of how is it that we allocate our resources to persuade and activate voters. Um, over the course of elections, what we've seen is a um, – is an exponential trajectory of the amount of data that is cons that is considered by predictive models. Um, but even more important than that is an exponential set of the use cases of models. Um, so you know, so sort of today we see every time a predictive model is used, it's used in a million and one ways, whereas, you know, in 2012, it might have been used towards, you know, towards 50 or 20 or 100 key decisions about each voter contact. Well, it's a fascinating use case to see how analytics and data can be brought to bear on uh, the democratic process and to help you get messages out, probably in a way that's better received by the by the voter or the prospective voter, um, you know, like in a, a retail or commercial environment, you don't want to hear things that aren't relevant to you. Uh, and when people do make an effort to provide you with information that is useful or that helps you make a decision, you benefit and, and you respect and even uh, admire and, and enjoy it. Yeah, I think that what I really want is for the voter experience to be as transparent and easy as possible, that campaigns reach out to me around the same time that I'm seeking information about who I'm going to vote for in, in November. You know, I, I know who I'm voting for in, um, in, tw in 2016, but even some local elections, I may not have made that decision yet. Mm -hmm. So I want sort of a steady stream of information to be reaching voters as they're in those key decision points with messaging that really is relevant to their lives. Mm. Um, and then also, I want to listen to what voters tell me. If a voter has a conversation with a volunteer at the door, that should inform future communications. 
if somebody has told me, you know, that they're definitely, um, if somebody has told me that they're definitely voting for the candidate, then, you know, the next conversation should be different from someone who says, hey, you know, I work in energy. I really want to know more about the um, about the secretary's energy policies. Sure, just as if a salesperson is engaging with a process and they use CRM, and that data is captured and uh, analyzed and shared, uh, that becomes a much better process for both the buyer and the seller. Same thing in a campaign, right? The better information you have, the more likely you are going to be able to serve that that user, that voter. I think there definitely are parallels to marketing. Um, and that's how we as Blue Labs um, decided to found the company and work across industries. Um, so we work with Fortune 100 retail organizations that are interested in how it is that once someone buys one item, how we can bring them back into the store to buy the follow-on item, or maybe to buy the follow-on item through that same store's online portal. Um, how it is that we can provide relevant messaging as users engage in, in complex processes online. Mm -hmm. um, all those things are driven from our lessons in politics. Politics is fundamentally different from, um, from, from, from retail, though, that it's a civic decision rather than, a, rather than an individual level decision. Mm -hmm. um, so I always want to be mindful that, you know, that I have a duty to voters to provide extremely relevant information to them so that they can be engaged in, this, in the civic decision that they need to make. Yeah. Suffice to say that good quality comparison shopping is still good quality comparison decision making. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Okay. But, um, now that we've established how really relevant, important, and powerful this type of analysis can be in the context of the 2016 campaign, I'd like to learn more about how you go about getting that analysis and making it relevant, speedy, uh, across a large variety of data sets and content sets and so forth. But first, let's hear more about Blue Labs. Tell me about your company, how it started, how, why you started it, and maybe a little bit about yourself as well. So the four of us who um, started Blue Labs met, some of us met in the 2008 election, some of us met in, during the 2010 midterms working at DNC. Um, throughout that pre-2012 experience, we had the opportunity as practitioners to try a lot of things, um, sometimes just once or twice, sometimes things that we operationalized within those cycles. Um, jumping forward to 2012, we had the opportunity to scale all that R&D, to say, hey, you know, we did this one thing that was kind of a different way of building models, and it worked for in this congressional race. Let's, you know, let's make this three people's full-time jobs. Let's scale that up. Um, so then moving, moving past 2012, where we got to build potentially one of the fastest growing startups, one of the most data driven organizations, um, we knew that we wanted, we knew that we built a special team. Um, we wanted to continue working together with ourselves and the folks who, you know, who, who we worked with and made, made all this possible. Um, we also wanted to apply the same types of techniques to other areas of social impact and other areas of commerce. Um, this individual level approach to identifying conversations is something that, that we found unique in the marketplace. We wanted to, to riff and expand on that. Um, increasingly, what we're working on is this segmentation of media problem. So this idea that um, some people watch only TV. You can't ignore TV. It has lots of eyeballs. Um, some people watch only digital. Some people consume a mix of media. How is it that you can build media plans that are aware of people's cross-channel media preferences and reach the right audience with, the, with their preferred means of communications? So that's fascinating. You, you start with the rigors uh, and demands of a political campaign, but then you can apply it in so many ways. Uh, answering the types of questions, anticipating the type of questions that more verticals, more sectors, uh, charitable organizations, of course, too, would want to be uh, involved with. So that, that's very cool. All right, let's go back to the, the data science. Um, you've got this vast pool of data. You've got a, a snappy analytics platform to work with, 
But one of the things that um, I'm interested in is how you get more people, whether it's in your organization or a campaign like the Hillary Clinton campaign or the Democratic National Committee, to then be able to utilize that data to get to these inferences, get to these insights that you want. What is it that you look for and what is it you've been able to do in that form of getting more people able to query, able to utilize the data? Yeah. So my general belief uh, is that data science happens when individuals have direct access to ask complex questions of a large but gnarly but well-integrated data set. Um, so if I have, let's say, 30 terabytes of data across online contacts, offline contacts, let's say maybe a sample of clickstream data, um, and I want to ask things like, of the people who went to my online platform and clicked the password reset because they couldn't remember their password, then never followed up with an email, how many of them showed up at a retail location within the next five days? Because they tried to engage online, it didn't, it didn't work out for them, I want to know, are we losing them or are they showing up in person? That type of question, maybe that would make it into a BI report, you know, a, a, a few months from then if it turns out to be successful, mm -hmm. but it's the type of question that people who are thinking about what we do every day and translating that, huh, I wonder about this into a query, then, you know, standing up and saying, aha, I think I found something. I think I found a way that, you know, that we can, that if, if we give these folks phone calls who lost their password, maybe we can reset their passwords over the phone, re-engage those folks. Um, just one tiny micro example, which is why data science is truly a human intensive exercise. You get 50, 100 people working at an enterprise solving problems like that, and what you ultimately get is a positive feedback loop of self-correcting systems mm -hmm. that every time that there's a problem, there's somebody thinking about how is that problem represented in the data? How do I quantify that? If it's significant enough, then how is it that the organization can, can improve in this one specific area? Mm -hmm. So that's all that all can be done with business logic is the interesting piece. Mm. You need very granular data that's accessible via query. And, um, you need reasonably fast query times because you can't ask questions like that when you're, you know, when you're going to get coffee every time you run a query. Mm. Um, then what layering predictive modeling allows you to do is it allows you to understand the opportunity for impact if you fix that problem. Mm -hmm. So say that, you know, that one hypothesis with that, with those users who, who can't reset their passwords is maybe those users aren't that engaged in the first place. So, you know, so, okay, you fix their password, but it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't move the needle. Mm -hmm. The other hypothesis is that it's people who are actively trying to engage with your service and unsuccessful because of this, this one very specific barrier. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a model of user engagement at an individual level, you can say, hey, these are really high value users that are having this problem, or maybe they aren't. Mm. So you take data science, align it with really smart individual level business analysis. What you get is an organization that continues to improve without it having to happen at, you know, at an executive decision level for each one of those things. Mm. So a great deal of, of inquiry, experimentation, iterative improvement, feedback loops can all come together very powerfully. And I'm all for the um, data scientist full employment um, uh, movement, but we need to do more than uh, have people have to go through data scientists to use and access and, and uh, develop these feedback insights. So. What is it about um, SQL or language or natural language, APIs, what is it that you like to see that allows for more people to be able to directly relate and engage with these data, uh, powerful data sets? So one of the things is the product management of data schemas. So whenever we build a analytics database for a large scale organization, I think a lot about what can an analyst who's 22, knows VLOOKUP, took some statistics classes in college, 
has, you know, has some personal stories about the industry that they're working in, so they know, you know, hey, my um, my grandmother is not a native English speaker. This is how this per this is how she'd use this website. So taking that hypothesis that's driven from personal stories, taking the then being able to rel through a relatively simple query translate that into a translate that into a database query find out if that hypothesis proves true at scale um, potentially take the results of that query dump them into you know into a statistical analysis language or use in database analytics to to answer that in a more robust way um, what that means is that our schemas favor very very wide schemas um, because I want someone to be able to write a to write a three-line SQL statement, no joins, that answers a business question that I wouldn't have thought to put in a report. Um, so that's the first line is analyst-friendly schemas that are accessed via SQL or Tableau. Um, then the then the next line is deep KPIs. So once we when, once we step out of the analytics database consumers, drop into the wider organization that's, you know, that's consuming data at a different level, I always want reporting to report on opportunity for impact, to report on are we reaching our most valuable customers, not how many customers are we reaching. Because are we reaching our most valuable customers is much more easily addressable. You just talk to different people. Whereas are we reaching are we reaching enough customers? I don't I don't know how to make I can I can go over to the sales team and yell at them to work harder. Um, but ultimately, I want our reporting to facilitate smarter workings, which means incorporating model scores and predictive analytics into our KPIs. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Let's uh, step back from the edge of where we engage uh, the analyst to the core, where we need to provide the ability for them to do what they want, and which gets them those great results. It seems to me that when you're dealing in a campaign cycle, that this is very spiky. You have a short period of time where there's a tremendous need for a tremendous amount of data, but that could quickly go down between cycles of, of an election or in a retail environment uh, leading up to a holiday season, for example, could be very intensive. Do you therefore take advantage of the cloud models for your analytics that um, you know make a fit for purpose approach to data and analytics pay as you go? Tell us a little bit about your strategy for the data and the analytics uh, engine. So all our customers have have a cyclical nature to them. Um, I think that actually almost every business is cyclical, just some more than others. Um, what that means is that um, horizontal scaling is incredibly important to us. It would be very difficult for us to do what we do without using a cloud model such as AWS. Um, also, one of the things that works well for us with Vertica is the licensing model, that we can add additional performance with only the cost of, of hardware or, or hardware provision through the cloud. Um, that allows us to scale up our clusters during the busy season and we'll sometimes even scale them back down during during slower periods um, so that we can have those 150 analysts asking their own their own questions about the areas of the program that they're responsible for during during busy cycles and then during less busy cycles you know scale down the um the footprint of the operation mm -hmm. is there anything else about the hpe vertica on demand a platform that benefits uh, your particular way and, and, and need for for analysis. I'm I'm thinking about the scale and the rows. You must have so many variables when it comes to, let's say, in a retail uh, situation, a commercial situation, uh, where you're trying to really understand that consumer. I do everything I can to avoid aggregation. Um, I want my analysts to be looking at the data at the interaction by interaction level. If it's a website, I want them to be looking at click clickstream data. If it's a retail organization, I want them to be looking at point of sale data. Um, in order to do that, we build data sets that are, you know, very frequently in the billions of rows. Um, they're also in very frequently incredibly wide um, because we don't just want to know every transaction and, you know, it with this dollar amount. 
Um, we want to know things like what were the census variables where that store was located. Getting back to the idea that we want our queries to be dead simple, uh, that means that we'll very frequently just append additional columns onto our transactional tables. We're okay that the tables get big because in a columnar model, we can pick out just the columns that we want for that particular query. Um, then moving into some of the in-database machine learning algorithms, that allows us to, um, to, to perform more higher order computation within the database and have less data shipping. Well, great. Uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, I wanted to uh, do some predictive analysis ourselves, uh, thinking about the next election cycle, midterms, only two years away. What might change between now and then? And because we hear so much about machine learning and bots and advanced algorithms, uh, how do you predict, Eric, uh, the way that big data will come and bear on uh, the next election cycle? I think that a big piece of the next election will be around moving even more away from demographic targeting, demographic input to models, more towards even more behavioral targeting. How is it that we reach every voter based on what they're telling us about them and what matters to them, how that matters to them? Then that will increasingly drive our models. Um, to do that, it involves you know, probably another 10x scale in the data because that type of data is um, is generally at the clickstream level, generally at the interaction by interaction level, mm. um, incorporating things like Twitter feeds adds an additional level of you know of, of complexity and and length and computational necessity to the data. Mm. Um, it almost sounds like you're shooting for sentiment analysis on an issue by issue basis, a uh, very complex undertaking, but could be very powerful. I think that it's heading in that direction. Yes. Well, very good. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. We've been exploring how data analysis services startup Blue Labs in Washington helps presidential campaigns better know and engage with potential voters. And we've learned how organizations are working smarter by leveraging innovative statistical methods and technologies, and in this case, looking at two-way voter engagement in entirely new ways in this and in future election cycles. So please join me in thanking our guest. We've been here with Eric Discant. He's the co-founder and vice president of Impact at Blue Labs in Washington. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. And a big thank you as well to our audience for joining us for this Hewlett Packard Enterprise Voice of the Customer Digital Transformation Discussion. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, your host for this ongoing series of HPE-sponsored interviews. Thanks again for listening, and please come back next time.